Hello, this is Dr. Ronald Wharton. I am an attending cardiologist at Montefiore Medical Center and assistant professor of medicine at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine in Bronx, New York. I'd like to share with you uh, some images of a patient in my practice. Uh, this is a young man who is short of breath when he exerts himself. So here's the scenario. He's 46. He's never had chest pain, and he has no conventional risk factors for premature coronary artery disease, but he's not been able to do the usual exercises that he likes to do for several months because he's noticing that he's getting progressively more and more winded. Next slide. This is a parasternal long axis of, from his echocardiogram. 2D image. Take a look at that. You'll notice that everything seems to be thickening normally. Both leaflets, the mitral and aortic, are both opening normally. In the next slide, you can see the measurements that were taken by the sonographer demonstrating uh, minimal concentric left ventricular hypertrophy with a normal left ventricular internal dimension in diastole. Next slide. I've also provided an M mode through the mitral valve, which you can look at. Next slide. Here are a few more images from his transthoracic echocardiogram. Apical four chamber, take a look. The next slide, you can see an apical four chamber with color Doppler. Take a look at that. In the next slide, I've provided an apical two-chamber. And in the next slide, I'm showing you pulse wave Doppler through the mitral valve. And in the following slide, you can see a tissue Doppler of the lateral mitral annulus. Note that the peak E prime velocity is more than eight centimeters per second. Next slide. This is a pulse wave Doppler through the left ventricular ad flow tract. Next slide. So why is my patient short of breath when he exerts himself? Do you think he has pulmonary hypertension? Do you think that this is an occult manifestation of coronary artery disease? Is he short of breath with exertion because of a diastolic abnormality of the left ventricle? Does he have pericardial disease? Or is this some sort of a valve problem? Next slide. Well, pulmonary hypertension would be unlikely from the 2D images that I showed you. The right ventricle appears structurally normal. The septal motion is normal. So there's nothing to suggest any overload on the right side of the heart. Coronary artery disease, well, at least in the resting study, there are no regional wall motion abnormalities. You'll also notice that the mitral inflow and the tissue Doppler of the mitral annulus are all normal, suggesting that there's no reason for this patient to have any premature stiffening of the left ventricle. Next slide. Again, if this were pericardial disease, the septal motion should look abnormal. There should be a variance of the septal motion depending on the respiratory cycle, or what's referred to as the septal bounce with uh, pericardial constriction. This patient has no such finding. There doesn't appear to be anything structurally wrong with the pericardium on the images. There's no pericardial effusion.
that leaves a valve problem. But what sort of valve problem? Next slide. Well, this is an excellent role for exercise echocardiography, especially since the patient states that he's short of breath when he exerts himself. We arranged for him to do just that with echocardiographic surveillance. That's another way of saying he had a stress echocardiogram. But we're not looking for coronary artery disease in this case. We're looking for something else. Next slide. Mostly, coronary disease is the reason stress echocardiograms are done. However, there is a large body of literature that allows you to do stress echocardiograms or suggests that it's a good idea in certain other situations. The most common is probably aortic stenosis. When patients state they're asymptomatic, and in fact they are symptomatic, Sometimes you want to know what the pulmonary pressures are when patients exert themselves, so you'll put them on an exercise bike, and when they're exercising at peak, you can check their tricuspid velocity signal. There's another reason you may want to do a stress echocardiogram, which may not be quite as obvious. Next slide. So again, I'm showing you a close-up of the resting echocardiogram on this gentleman. And this is focusing on the aortic valve leaflets, the left ventricular airflow tract, and the mitral valve. And you'll notice that even though the mitral valve appears to be closing normally, some of the chordae going to the anterior mitral leaflet are moving anteriorly with systole. Now, at rest, that doesn't seem to be much of a problem. Next slide. But here's what happens when this gentleman starts exercising. This is a apical long axis uh, at the peak of stress, and the patient had uh, gone into uh, stage two of the Bruce protocol when this image was taken. And look very carefully. And then I'm going to show you in the next slide an image from the apical four-chamber view at stress. And you may notice that there is systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve with a very hyperdynamic ventricle. In the next slide, you can see the continuous wave Doppler through the left ventricular outflow tract. And notice that the heart rate is 104 beats per minute. And the peak velocity through the LVOT is more than five meters per second. Next slide. So, without too much exertion, remember the heart here is only a little, heart rate here is only more than a, a little more than 100 beats a minute. This patient has already generated a gradient between the left ventricle and the aorta of over 100 millimeters of mercury. Next slide. So. This is a case of somebody whose resting echocardiogram is not that impressive, but actually has very significant systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve with exertion. And this is causing dynamic LVOT obstruction, just as you're accustomed to seeing in patients who have the genetic form of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And I should also mention that this patient's resting electrocardiogram is entirely normal, unlike patients who have genetic hypertrophic cardiomyopathy where there are invariably STT wave abnormalities and often significant left ventricular hypertrophy. You'll notice this patient's uh, LVH is very modest. The septum and the posterior wall were measured at 1.2 and 1.1 centimeters respectively. Next slide. So the teaching point here is that not all systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve is hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Where else do we find it? It can be found uh, after surgery when uh, posterior prolapse is being corrected. Sometimes if the annuloplasty ring is too small and the anterior leaflet too long, uh, SAM can ensue. Um, we can see SAM in situations where there are acute uh, apical wall motion abnormalities, such as patients who have acute apical ballooning or an acute apical infarction where the base of the LV is hyperdynamic. That's typically in the situation where you have an occlusion of the mid portion of the left anterior descending artery. Once in a while, you might see this after surgery to correct aortic stenosis. Aortic stenosis typically leaves patients with significant left ventricular hypertrophy, but their systolic function is limited because of the afterload imposed by the aortic stenosis. And then all of a sudden, you fix their aortic valve, uh, 
that afterload is relieved and the LV goes off to the races and if the anatomy is just right and there's a sufficient amount of hypertrophy, you can get SAM in that situation as well. As was in the case of this patient, some patients who only have caudal SAM at rest can develop significant SAM not of the cords but of the valve itself when they exert themselves. Next, pair. Next slide. This is a patient who would benefit from beta blockade and hydration, just as you would treat a patient who has hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And if all efforts fail, there's no myomectomy to be done because the LV thickness is close to normal. The only thing you can do is replace the mitral valve. So far, we haven't reached that, and I hope we don't have to in this patient. I hope you found this educational, and thank you for tuning in.